Right, I thought we could um, talk tonight about longing and hesitation. So two, two movements, opposite. Not ultimately, but in terms of seeking, they feel as if they were opposite. So the sense of longing, um, you know, as, you know, in the mode of spiritual seeking, this longing can feel quite personal. You know, when we first get into spirituality, you know, we might phrase it like, you know, I want, I want to be happy. I want to be at peace. Um, maybe if we're a little more spiritually ambitious, we might say, I want to get enlightened. And, um, you know, sort of jump into spirituality with both feet and, um, there's lots to be excited about there. There's, um, you know, new theologies, spiritual experiences, um, you know, a, a sense of a more noble purpose, a spiritual community, perhaps. Um, maybe, I don't know, maybe new diets and change our name and whatever. But perhaps we can see that all of those, um, all of that seeking comes from the same conditioned personal self, right? I want, and this is how I plan to go about it. Um, you know, I've heard that, you know, spiritual experiences are indicative of spiritual progress. I've heard that, um, you know, being part of a spiritual community is may be essential, certainly supportive. And if I feel like I'm a part of that, then it feels good. And if I feel good, I must be on the right path. But all of that is still coming from the same place. Not that our motivations is wrong, but it's, it's, um, they're arising from a particular place, from a belief in a personal self that wants something that it believes it doesn't have now, right? But if I do these things, then at some future point, then I will have what I want. So the sense of gaining something that I don't now have that I want, that's also coming from this sense of personal self, illusory self. So that's when I talk about longing, that's not the kind of longing that I'm really talking about. The, the kind of longing that I, I want to point to here tonight is comes actually from a deeper place. It comes from almost a sense of um, uh, almost a sense of source seeking itself through your form. So and um, this is Total, total projection on my part, but it's almost as if Source enjoys playing this cosmic game of hide and seek where it being the, the one thing that exists um, hides out in this apparent separate personal self and then off we go seeking to find unity, believing all the while that we're somehow separate from Source but it's really source playing all the roles here. So um, ultimately there's no, no downside, um, but this lifetime is certainly more enjoyable if we catch on to the game and understand that it's really uh, this awareness as this deepest sense of presence of our essential beingness, let's call it. So the sense of longing um, can um, feel like it can, the, the true sense of longing can carry us through um, the challenging times of spirituality because um, this journey, the egoic self loves the journey, loves the idea of getting somewhere, improving, you know, on the, on the path, you know, the the noble quest, it, it loves that. It just doesn't like the destination. It doesn't like 
where all of that is heading if we pursue it to its limits. It doesn't like the idea of stripping away our self-identity. That's the hard work. But this true sense of longing, um, since it comes from a deeper place, uh, has the capacity to uh, push us through our fears, through um, this sense of you know, stripping away our, the identity that we thought we were, you know, it, it, it pushing us to be willing to look at um, some of those shadow areas that we may not have wanted to look at for a long time. It may have the gravitational effect of pulling us back into contraction. Um, but this longing may be sufficient to give us courage to really look at those areas as well. And also beyond just any sense of, of doubt or not knowing, because there are certainly times on the spiritual journey where we don't know where it's going. <laughs> and, and it can feel like, you know, I've been at this for an, quite some time and it feels like I don't know where this is going. I'm lost. I don't know what's next. I don't know what to do. And yet this longing can, um, in a sense, give us the momentum to um, be willing to experience those uncomfortable states and still move forward, not knowing exactly where we're going. So this is longing. This is this is a deep, heartfelt longing. It's not a it's not a personal. Doesn't come out of personal will. Um, personal will, you know, just it just wants something for itself. It's what, you know, we all have been thoroughly conditioned to believe that what we are is this individual package um, that has wants and desires and personal will, and this is how we get ahead and we think we can apply the same rules in spirituality, but we can't. I mean, we can try and we can try for a long time to do that. But one of the um, unrelenting forces in spirituality is that um, the sense of coming from egoic effort will eventually be frustrated. Adyashanti used to call it the path of failure, right? Trying, 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 trying my heart out. I want to get this. It's the I want part that gets frustrated because the I that wants isn't what wakes up. It's what we wake up from. Right? So this, this question about um, the term spiritual liberation sort of begs the question, liberation from what? And it's actually the liberation from the belief in what I am is this separate personal self. That's what we wake up from. That's the liberation. The liberation isn't getting to a high state where we just feel really, really, really good all the time. That's not the liberation. And the attempt to get to that particular state, which is possible, it's just not possible as a, an abiding way to live life. We can have those high moments, beautiful, <laughs> but they will cycle between equally contracted moments, particularly if we're seeking only the high moments. It's just how it works. So the freedom is actually from that personal desire to be in ecstatic states. Of course they feel good. Of course they do. But the desire to have it all the time 
is different than being in alignment to however life reveals itself at every moment. And the willingness to be in alignment with life as it shows up on life's terms is liberation. That's the freedom. It's the freedom from the demands of this personal self, the idea of this illusory separate self. Okay, so that's, that's this longing. And the hesitation is um, obviously comes from a different place. The hesitation comes from the, the same sense of personal self that we've been talking about. And it's the mind basically cautioning you, like, don't be, don't be in too big a hurry to go down that particular road um, towards mm, the dissolution of this sense of personal identity, you know. And so this is the mind talking to itself. It's, it's like it says, trust me. You know, I've been your commander in chief for a long time. You know, I'm not ready to give up my presidency. I'm, I want to stay in control. You've trusted me so far. I've served you reasonably well. And, um, you know, just don't just don't go off without me. <laughs> is what the mind is telling us. Trust me. You know, and, and it's like, yeah, it's this sense of personal self feels a little you know, tight, a little contracted sometimes, a little annoying perhaps sometimes, a little embarrassing sometimes, but hey, it's familiar, you know. And if, if you, the sense of giving that up, as if we could do that, the sense of giving that up equates to a sense of extinction. Right? That's the fear. That's the mind telling us, you know, if you, you know, give up the sense of personal identity, what will you be? Right? That's the fear. We don't know what we would be. You know, the, the, the personal separate self may feel a little awkward, a little clumsy sometimes, but hey, it's familiar. So, and I've spent a lot of effort sort of polishing that identity. It's not perfect, maybe, but, you know, just give me a little more time and I'll work on it. So that's the sense of it. But that's all um, coming from a very uh, uh, extensive cultural conditioning where this sense of a personal separate self is never questioned. You know, there's never, you know, a sense of being in, in reality, not in concept, not in theology, but in actual felt sense, anything other than a separate self. So this idea in spirituality to um, recognize when we look deeply within that um, we can find thoughts and feelings and sensations and perceptions, memories, hopes, dreams, all of that we can find. We just can't find that personal entity to which that's occurring. We assume that it must be here. People ask me, you know, I knock on the door and the person on the other side Ask who is there, and I say, it's me. You know, that's who we take ourselves to be, me, I, this. So to even question that, um, you know, there may be a great reluctance on the part of the, this sense of identity to, to even be willing to question that. And even if we are, even if there is some recognition of uh, the presence of this awareness, there still can be the sense of, yes, but there's this me, this is where this identity is housed, and over there that I can sometimes visit is the awareness. So even when there's a recognition of the awareness, 
the identity can still remain firmly housed in this body-mind. So that's, this, that's where this resistance comes from. That's where this sense of hesitation, like keeping one foot on the brake and the other foot on the gas, like there's this longing and then there's this, oh, not so fast, you know, I'm, I gotta keep my foot on the brake just in case it doesn't turn out like I hope. All right, so those are the two, the two movements. The longing, as we talked about, comes from, uh, um, we could say it comes from source, but um, the idea of source as an external entity is not correct. It's really coming from our deepest nature, which is not other than source itself. So that movement, um, knows what it's doing. It may seem at times like it's, you know, taking its time, but sometimes there needs to be a certain, certain experiences, certain adjustments in our life to be ready to receive what, uh, what needs to be seen. And on the other hand, there's this, this resistance, this hesitation, like, Again, the mind telling us, don't be so sure, you know, this is maybe just all made up theology or philosophy and, you know, not, not entirely to be trusted. And so this is the mind talking to itself. So it's good to understand that the mind will never understand this. It may eventually settle into its rightful position as a useful tool but it will never willingly relinquish its position of authority. We've given it, we've given away our authority to our thinking mind and our thinking mind is not willing to give it back without a considerable effort in investigation of how that actually works. So the way to work with that is not to try to make those thoughts of separate self go away. It's not to, you know, sort of mentally, you know, wrestle any egoic self out of the picture. None of that works. Um, but what we can do is see, see how it operates, see the consequences of our belief in existence, go looking for it, really go looking for it. And if we can find it, let me know. <laughs> but when we go looking for it, what we recognize is that it is not there. All we, all we come across is this spacious presence, awake presence, let's say. Empty. Empty of what? Empty of the sense of personal self. Just awake. Just present experiencing life through this apparently individualized form. But what experiences that ultimately is this awake presence, which is not personal. So when these, you know, sense of personal self arise when we can see it functioning, just see it, just see it. You don't have to try to get rid of those thoughts. You won't be able to do that, but you can see them. And the more clearly they're, they're seen, the less control they have over, over our behavior. So that's what we can do. Just acknowledge, yes, there's that movement of mind again, you know, exercising, you know, it's sense of power telling us what we think we should know, repeating old stories from the past, doubting the existence of anything beyond conceptual thought, because that's all the mind can do. It can think in words, it can think conceptually, 
it can't go beyond that. So the thinking mind will never understand awareness. We can, we can be it, we can live from it, but we'll never be able to step outside it and look at it as we look at other objects, simply because it's not another object, it's just this capacity to be aware. So just notice these two movements. Trust the sense of longing from a deeper sense, not from an egoic wanting, but from a deeper sense of, of um, a very simple sense of desiring just happiness or contentment. There's something that, that simple. And being willing to follow that thread wherever it may lead. Recognizing that, you know, the thinking mind may come in from time to time and try to dissuade us from our journey. And that's what it does. And uh, there's a purpose to that. It wants to make sure that our longing is, in a sense, pure. 